do this. Three, okay. two, one. So we're live? I think so. Let's wing it. Let's let's go for that. Let's just pretend we are live, shall we? Okay. <laughs> I have the big honor to welcome you guys to this live stream masterclass with David Weiss, hosted by Daniel Thetter from uh, Gentle Gamer. Uh, my name is Dirk Ian, and I'd like to say a few words about the context of this event before we uh, started um, and before David and uh, Daniel do their thing. Um, I am a librarian uh, at the Central Library of Düsseldorf Public Libraries, and I am responsible for everything gaming in the broadest sense. So uh, this year, the Central Library moves to a different location, uh, which gives us more space, better equipment, new furniture, and all in, uh, uh, and all, in all a nicer environment for you, our visitors and patrons. Uh, we think uh, that it is time that gamer and gaming uh, gets a place and a physical space in Düsseldorf. So... Uh, a space to talk, to argue about games and just play games. Uh, a space where gamer and non-gamer can meet. So we are hoping that we can create such a meeting point, a home, if you will, uh, for gamer, gaming and gaming culture in Düsseldorf. And that is why we think it's important for us as a library to organize such events and give uh, you the opportunity to talk games, to recognize the art of creating games and appreciate gaming culture as a whole. So that's our take on gaming and why we do this. Um, at last, I want to invite you all to come to Düsseldorf. Uh, the new Central Library, uh, which you see in the background, will be opened in autumn uh, or by the end of the year. And after all the restrictions we are currently under uh, are lifted, I think uh, that a visit is uh, uh, well worth your time. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's talk games and music. I uh, am so excited. So uh, thank you. And I hope we uh, see each other in a person someday. So. Daniel, David, Great. take it away. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dirk. So, uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, just as Dirk said, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm just an ordinary guy with a, a video game website who happens to know David Weiss and happens to know the guys from the um, City Library of Düsseldorf. Um, don't worry, you won't be seeing uh, much of me today because everything you see today is uh, obviously about this uh, legendary man and uh, his music. So um, just to uh, give you a rundown on what we're doing today, Dave will um, talk about his career, talk about his influences, and obviously will show you something today. Uh, you will be uh, basically be having the chance to look be um, yeah, over his shoulder to, sh to see how he works his magic for over 30 years. Obviously, a lot has changed. And um, after this presentation or after his um, explanations, you will be able to ask questions and you can um, put in your questions in the live chat. I will be monitoring the chat. I will be the guy, the gentle gamer, obviously, who uh, is going to in interact with you and ask Dave the, Dave the questions. Just uh, for a heads up, please understand, obviously, um, if Dave is working on any game that hasn't been announced at the moment, he's under NDA, so he can't answer anything about a possible Donkey Kong Country, about anything regarding to new projects or anything that hasn't been revealed yet. So please understand we can't ask those questions. Um, besides that, feel free to ask. I will do my best to, um, to read the chat and ask him your questions. And if not, I'm very sorry. I really do my best. So uh, please bear with me on that. Um, well, Enough about me, and um, Dave, the stage is yours, so okay, take thank care. You, thank you very much. Well, um, a huge thank you to everybody for joining me today. I hope you can all hear me. And um, we're going to divide this into two sections, really. The, the first is a bit of history and um, my early career. How did I get to be a video game composer? And the second part of it is how do I go about composing music for video games? Very generic. Um, I've, I've got a sketch I've been working on. I haven't finished it on purpose because I think it's important to see the whole process. So what we're going to do, we are going to go to my video player and I'm going to show you, in case anybody doesn't know who I am, um, some of the games that I've, I've worked on. I'll, I'll talk over these with a bit of an explanation. So 
So this first one is Slalom, that was my first game for Rare. And it's very early days, I wasn't very good at using the, the sound chip in those days. It only has two pulse channels, a triangle and a noise channel. So it's quite limited and it was quite a challenge to make games. But a few years later I got hold of the sound chip and managed to get it a bit better than it um, had been originally. Then we, we moved over to the SNES and then the Wii U and the Switch and uh, you're probably quite familiar with this game. It's nice to hear Brian Blessed on the um, advert. Always been a fan of Brian Blessed. Great voice. Now the N64. I worked on this game called Diddy Kong Racing which um, has more than a passing resemblance to Mario Kart, although you can fly and you can drive the boats as well. Now, uh, ukulele, this one with Grant Kirkhope and also Steve Burke. We did this a few years ago now. Great fun to work on. Obviously it features ukuleles. And this one was from Play Playtonic Games, just in case anybody's wondering. And if you haven't played it yet, go and get it. I did this with Phil Tossel and Jennifer uh, over at Nyam Nyam and also Rio Gar and this was a, a iOS game, Tengami. I use a lot of Koto, clearly as you can hear, and uh, an another fun game to make, very, very creative game I thought. And this one from Sumo Digital, this was great fun to make. It's uh, an exploring game, puzzle game as well, and uh, used a lot of South American instruments on this one. So there we go. Anyway, this is all unscripted. I did have a script and um, it's upstairs in the printer, so I'm gonna wing it. And um, that's a good link into writing music because writing music really is permanently winging it. Uh, as I said before, there's not, a, there's not a right way or a wrong way, so I'm going to show you how I go about composing music for video games. So let's have a look here. So a big thank you to obviously Dusseldorf City Libraries and, and Daniel over at Gentle Gamer. So I'm going to talk about lessons. So a, a lot of people have said it's about being in the right place at the right time, especially when they hear how I got my, um, my job with Rare Limited. And I happened to be at a video game, no, sorry, I happened to be at a music shop selling instruments and these two gentlemen talk, called Tim and Chris came in for a demonstration and that's how I got my job. But I think with, with most jobs that you get, you've, you've probably gone to college, you've gone to school, college, hopefully university, and you've, you've acquired a skill set. And if somebody's advertising a job, hopefully you've got the right skill set for them and those two points converge and you go off on a different path and you start training and learning with that company and going forward. Now for my job it was totally unique because in my days when I was getting my first job there weren't really many video game composers there were only a few and we stretched around the world very few of us but before that I started by having piano lessons as a kid. Now at that time I was about seven years old and my brother, who was two years older, was having piano lessons, but I was going to have to wait two years before I could have my piano lessons or start my piano lessons. So I could see my brother learning, he was reading sheet music and, and all of that kind of stuff. But for me, I was going to have to wait. Um, at that time, I didn't realise how useful that wait was because I could go over to the piano and I started to pick things out by ear. So I was learning to play melodies and chords by listening. I'm to sorry, Dave. Yes. Just going to intervene for a second. Could you uh, center your uh, video a bit more to the right because it overlaps with your um, with your webcam video? Okay, I can do that. Two seconds. So what do I need to do? So what do I need to do, Daniel? Here. Uh, the middle video with the instruments. If you could put it a bit more to the right, uh, okay. that it's uh, Fine. better centered. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. How about that? Sorry it's, about it, guys. That's all right. It's, it's live. There we go. Anyway, so piano lessons. Um, so because I couldn't have piano lessons, I was learning how to play things by ear, and that was a really good skill to learn. And eventually I did start having piano lessons, but um, 
I, I got bored of those. It's very structured and it wasn't, it just wasn't rock and roll really. Anyway, I was getting quite interested in the piano, uh, uh, sorry, in the trumpet, and I convinced my parents to buy me a trumpet. But if I was going to have a trumpet, I was going to learn how to play it properly. So they enrolled me into a junior brass band, and that's just not rock and roll either. But it was a, a really good way of learning how to play the, uh, sorry, learning how to play the trumpet, and also how to play with other people, because you're part of a, a large section and your bit's very important. And, and that's how I learned to play the trumpet. So that was, that was quite an important part of my musical education. Now, after playing in the brass band for a few years, um, I, I decided that I wanted to play drums. That looked far more interesting. So drums it was, I had a paper round and I, I did it for years, probably two or three years. I'd wake up at seven in the morning, do a paper round, go to school, come home from school, do another paper round. Um, and that's in the days, obviously, before the internet, because people used to read papers then and, and have them as physical papers. And that's how I earned my money to buy drums for, for a drum kit. And I was in, in this brass band, and my, my parents, bless them, they still took me to the brass band and, in, and insisted that I learn to play percussion properly. Now, for me, drumming is laying down a groove and, and getting into something and, and smacking the drums as hard as possible, but... In a brass band or an orchestra, I used to play in both. It, it isn't quite the same. It, it's you're playing really percussion. I was playing snare, and you do the, the odd snare fill every now and again, and then you'd have to wait countless bars. Now, after playing in that brass band for a few years, we were doing a very big concert, and I was going to have to wait. It was about 107 bars. I remember it well, but it wasn't just four four. There was five four seven four. I forget the piece, and I didn't really. We hadn't really rehearsed it. I wasn't sure of when. I needed to come in and my, my big moment was this big cymbal crash with two big cymbals and by bar night I'd completely lost count of where we were and uh, being unfamiliar with a piece of music when I thought it was bar 107 I'd pick my cymbals up and give them a big splash at the beginning of the bar two bars early and so everybody in the band turned around glared at me looked at me and um, that was my last um, attempt at playing in a, in a brass band or percussion and at that point I decided I would go and join my friends in a punk band and play um, punk music really. At that point I, I went to college and I, I was playing in bands as well with um, other musicians which was great fun and then when college ended, it, in fact it, it ended early because I, I wasn't really um, College probably wasn't for me, so I, I decided I'd get a job, and I went to sell drums in this music shop, which is in the centre of Leicester in the UK, and that window above the sign is where I spent quite a lot of time trying to sell drums. Now, even in those days, drums weren't quite as popular as playing keyboards or guitar or that sort of stuff. So I'd spend most of my time upstairs. If I played the drums, it would uh, you'd, you'd hear it throughout the whole shop so you couldn't do it all the time which was a, a a bit limiting so most of my time was dusting the drums making them look good setting them up and and that kind of stuff it really really wasn't the best job in the world if i'm honest but it was a good start and I, at least i was doing something musically now it was it was at that time whilst i was selling drums that uh, a guy from yamaha came in and he had a thing called a cx5 music computer so he brought it in and said it was going to be the future, apparently it was, and in a few years time we're all going to be using music computers to write music with. Now at that time I wasn't particularly convinced that this was the way, and neither was anybody else. We, we left that box with the CX-5 in downstairs for, for several weeks, probably several months, and the Yamaha rep came in again, and he said, look, you've, you've really got to learn it, other, other places are selling, it's selling quite well, and we've, we've invested a lot into it, it's, it's going to be the future. No, no one was interested, but the manager, as part of an incentive to learn how to use that, that software, he, he, he said, look, you can have an extra day off a week as long as you take this unit home and learn how to use it. And that was it. I was sold. If I could have an extra day off, I, yeah, sure, I'd learn how to use this thing. It also should be said that my, my, my dad, bless him, he was really involved with computers, and because I was sort of a rebellious teen, I didn't really want to learn how to use computers but the the extra day off in the week that was a real incentive 
So a few weeks later, having spent about three days a week learning how to use the CX-5, I, I took it back in and I set this thing up. And uh, I could use it. It had this thing called MIDI on it. And I could, that, that was a big deal really. It had this four operator synth chip on it. In fact, I'll, I'll show you what this synth sounded like. Because I've got a plug-in down here called the RM2612. So hopefully here it is and this this thing sounds a bit like not particularly very interesting but um, that was the sound chip that was in the CX-5 as I said the, the big deal was that it had MIDI and I could set it up and I was demonstrating with things like go west we close our eyes using drum machines and stuff so I have a photo of said drum machine and computer hopefully there it is so if you can see it um, hopefully my photo isn't blocking this um, we had this CX-5 it had this this unit here which wasn't particularly powerful but it was enough to play a sound chip and have MIDI and I'd hook this up to a Juno, an Alpha Juno from Roland, and a drum machine. And the other thing I had as well when I wasn't using the CX-5 was a, a Korg SQD-1 that worked quite well. And eventually these, these two gentlemen came in, Tim and Chris, they owned this company called Rare, and they were looking for somebody to write music for them for this thing called the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, I was completely unaware of this. They came in, asked for a demonstration, gave them the big thing and eventually I ran out of Go West numbers and Duran Duran numbers and had to give them an example of some of the, my own numbers that I'd played. Uh, I think it was Chris turned around to Tim and they said, oh, we're monsters. And I wasn't sure whether that was good or bad, but they, they asked to go up to the office. We went up to the office and I thought, great, I've got somebody else on finance. And instead of wanting finance, they offered me a job and they brought all the equipment and a few weeks later I was going to go over to Rare Limited and start writing music for video games and that's how I got my job. So that convergence of my skill set that I'd already learnt was uh, how I started my career. It wasn't quite that easy. They'd, they'd bought this farmhouse in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the Warwickshire countryside and um, it needed all the stuff inside it taking out of it, throwing into large skips or burning. And then there was a lot of building work. So I spent the first six weeks working at Rare, building walls, plastering, painting, tidying up. And when my office was eventually ready, they set me in front of Mario, which was the first Mario thing, and said, look, play that for a few weeks. So I played that for three weeks, got an idea. I really enjoyed the music, Koji Kondo there. And after that, they said, well, you need to write some music. We've got this game, and uh, it's called Slalom. And I had a Roland MT32, which is like a multi-timbral unit, and it played lots of noises at the same time. And I had my, the, the R8 drum machine and my synths, and I spent about three weeks making these compositions that I was really quite happy with. And then it clicked that I was actually going to have to put these compositions onto the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is a bit compromised, to say the least. I think I've said before it really sounds like a doorbell and um, yeah it took a long time of working out what the notes were I, I wrote them down in a thing called hex and so 81 would be a, a C and there'd be a, a note length and there'd be a few subroutines so it took me a long long time to work out how to get this tune onto the NES but eventually we got there and here we go this is me when I was couple of years younger than I am now and I've got an old Amstrad computer there and an NES and a card and that was my development system that's how I started writing music for video games so what's next here we go so b before we start talking about um, writing music I think the one thing that's really important as far as mixing and trying to find the the right instruments is thinking of the sound sound space as a bowl or a mixing bowl and this is how i i think having spent many many years learning how to um, compose and mix tracks 
this is um, uh, for, for anybody out there who's who's at that stage. I wish somebody had have showed me this when I was um, at the beginning of my career, because mixing really is like a bowl, and and so is writing as well. The bass instruments need to be in mono at the bottom of the mix, and they take quite a lot of energy to get the bass loud enough. And the thing above that directly is the lead. All all of your lead sounds they need to be bright and they need to be hearable. And then the rest of it is the instrumentation. And that's very similar to writing music on the NES. We had three channels, we had this triangle wave that spent a lot of time being the bass. And they, there were these two pulse waves and they did all the instrument work. And then there was a um, noise channel, which didn't sound anything other than a noise channel, like tsh -tsh -tsh. So again, that kind of fits in with that bowl. And then as instruments, and when we went to the SNES, we had eight channels to play with and that kind of bowl is really important when it comes down to mixing and writing so how do we go how, how do I go about writing music for video games now normally when you're writing stuff for a client or for, for rare in the early days they come up with an idea and they say look we've I don't know, say for Wizards and Warriors, they'd have a, a castle and you'd see these castle graphics and you would see a, a knight wandering around and you'd think, oh, that's great. Yeah, I really like that. That's cool. And they would be setting the agenda. And it's much easier when somebody sets the agenda for you or you set the agenda for somebody else. So if, if I had another musician working for me, I'd say, well, you know, we need this. These are the things that you need to work with, the sounds you want. But for this instant and, and for my example, I had to come up with a scenario myself. So for me, my scenario is going to be a beach in the Caribbean, which looks to me like this. Um, so given the choice, I would love to be sitting on a beach in the Caribbean with a pina colada looking at the sea rolling in. And so that's where we're going to start with. So what sort of instruments are we going to use? So um, Google it and comes up with lots of ideas for Caribbean instruments but before we do that uh, I need to get in the zone I need to find a place where we're going to be to start adding instruments so the first thing I'm going to do using M media bay I've I found this file here hopefully um, it's it's a C thing here and I'm going to just mute some of the sounds I've got already and let's start with some background noise. Let's have a look. So hopefully, if this is all working properly, just turn it off a bit. This is my scene setting bit and that's going to put me right in the right mood and the right space for adding instrumentation and getting into the, the vibe of where I want to take this. Now the first thing I really want is some steel drums. So these are going to be the main focus. I like steel drums, I think they're a really cool instrument. This I am going to use Let's have a look. There we go, eight Geos steel drums. Which sound something like this. So I put my ocarina on at the same time. Let's just get rid of the ocarina on the track here. So here we go. Anyway. This is my steel drum sound I'm going to be using. Now before I do anything, I want to um, set this in. It's a fairly laid back piece that I want to try and create, quite relaxing pad sound. I'm going to take this pad sound here and need some relaxing chords to go with it. So I thought, so let's start again. 
on the track properly. Excuse me, Dave. Yes. Could you turn up your uh, microphone a bit? I can indeed. Or lower the music a bit, one or the other, okay. because uh, some people are having difficulty hearing you. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully that, that's a bit better. Let's try turning that microphone up. I'll put it close to me. Turn my gain up. So could, could if, if you're um, on, on the other end of this, can you let Daniel know if you can actually hear me now? Okay, let's look at the pad sound now. I've, I found this thing from Native Instruments called Arcus which does some great pad sounds. Let's have a look. So for me, I want something quite chilled and I, I just happened to come across this. So I'm going to go with that chord sequence that's kind of working for me. But before I do that, I'm going to need some drums. So I really like these drums from Native Instruments and it's their Cuba drums and they, they sound quite cool. So let's have a listen to those. So it's good, it's got these preset rhythms, which is makes things a lot quicker than messing around. And certainly when you're, I spend most of my time um, in the morning just putting down quick sketches and that's how I get my ideas for stuff that I'm doing. So this came from an early sketch. And I don't want the tempo to be too quick here. So let's start furnishing this out now. So here we go. Tempo is quite important here. If it's too fast, it's, it's going to race far, far too much. So it needs to be laid back and a good exploratory tune needs a fairly laid back tempo. And then the next thing I want to start doing is putting my, my pad down. Take them from the top again. So we need to start filling that out. That pad sound, by the way, is, is taking up a lot of the frequency domain. So it's great whilst we've got very little instrumentation, it's filling it out, it's giving us an idea of where we're going. 
Later on as we start adding instruments, that's just going to be too much, so we need to start taking instruments out so we can get things to breathe a bit more. But for now we're just going to start filling these in. And I'm going to start with a bit of bass I think. Well, once I've armed the track properly. So I'm quite happy with that, so um, let's stop putting this base down now. So I'm quite happy with that bass bit now. Now normally no, nobody actually sees me writing music so I can make as many mistakes as I want, ditch them all and um, either edit them or just go back and play it loads over and over again and that's a really good method for coming up with melodies. If you're going over and over and over again on the piece that you're trying to create you'll just suddenly start getting ideas that come, to, come into your head so that rep repetition of going through things many many times I find is really important and because I'm not the best player in the world it, it kind of happens naturally so we're going to try and get some guitar now I, a ukulele or an acoustic guitar would be nice here <laughs> that's my bass I want something to go with that a lot of the time when you hear Caribbean music or one of the bits that I like about some Caribbean music I listen to is that the bass and the guitar are doing very very similar patterns and there's just something where they're both played live and it's not quite there it just adds something to the whole vibe do I'm going to uh, go for that and try recording that one adding to the bass and hopefully it'll give a nice nice vibe then we can start working on some guitar patterns Okay, 
So I'm going to have a listen to that and hopefully we've got something that we can start working with and putting some melod melodies down on and some other instrumentation. Now I'm going to start adding some chords just to add a bit of interest and here's here's some I prepared earlier now this is a really cool instrument it's from Native Instrument and it's from their um, guitar range they, they do quite a few now but this one is quite cool it's called Picked Acoustic So I'm going to add those. Hopefully get that a bit higher in the mix so I can hear it. I can always take it down later. Let's add to that. I'm quite happy with that, as happy as can be. Now that big squeaking sound you can hear is my chair. It makes the right noise. You just have to put it with it because I can't change it easily. So I'm going to put some steel drums down next, but before I do that, I'm actually going to find an ocarina. Now I like the ocarina and this one's a particularly good one. It's from a company called Impact Soundworks. Now it'd be nice if I could go out and buy one and learn to play one but there's, there's only so much I can do. So the next best thing is this instrument. In fact, I have not armed it properly. Two seconds, bear with me. Here we go. So over to the ocarina. Now, uh, the ocarina is not the most interesting sound on its own, but it gets interesting when you start adding performance features to it. Now, with any instrument that you're playing on the keyboard, it can sound very piano-ish, because obviously it's a piano keyboard, this one. So anything that you can do to give it a performance is going to make it sound a bit more human. So playing it in live is really key, and then perhaps just editing some of the mistakes away. But for things like this... I've got key switches so I can start putting little little inflections in there. And all of those things help to give a performance which makes 
makes it a lot more interesting to the listener. So I'll see how we get on with that. Let's start putting this down. Not that inflection, <laughs> that's quite awful. Here we go, let's do that again. The good thing is we can just get rid of that and put another one in. So I've noticed here is already in the mix it's starting to get a bit too full it's hard to hear that ocarina because it's being drowned out by some of these pad chords so I am going to get rid of some of these just to give it a bit of variation in the mix too so let's line those up let's go back to those and I'm just going to move everything over by bar just to line it all up again now if I get rid of those pad chords, we should start to get some more definition because at the moment, if we go back to our bowl, wherever it is. Two seconds, here we go, here's my bowl. At the moment, we've got far too much all around here, so we need to start eking out a, a bit of a hole. So getting rid of that pad sound is going to do wonders and just put that lead sound or our lead sound straight in the mix for us. Still drum time and um, what I want to do for this one now if we just play it in the melody it will be fine but it will sound a bit static now having watched steel drums being played there's a lot of rolling going on because they can't get a sustain note so they're gonna have to do a lot of rolls and stuff now I can't do that without actually setting up two notes one on each hand to get a proper trill so to make do and give it the illusion that we've we've got proper steel drums I'm gonna just roll between two notes So without further ado, let's get some um, steel drums in there and then we'll start knocking out the other instruments which are getting in the way. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to leave it there with the, the steel drums now. The ocarina, it's a bit too clashing with the steel drums. Those frequencies are all, all in the same space, so we've got a couple of things we can do there. We can start EQing things. Possibly the easiest way here, here is to have a melody and the answer on the steel drums, or just to literally cut out some of the ocarina altogether. instrument. So this is where I go through my box of woodwind instruments, virtual box of course, and find something different. work on this a bit earlier I have to admit and it, it, having spent a bit of time on it earlier it still needs a lot more time these things just need chipping away at getting the initial idea it's normally fairly quick it comes quite instantaneously I would expect to get a, an initial tune done in an hour to two hours that's worth working with but then after that it just takes a lot of time to get the melodies working So what I'm going to do after this session, I'm going to take those melodies and really start honing them down, picking out the bits that I really like, the strongest bits, and then start jettisoning the bits that I, I don't like anymore, the bits that don't work will, just won't be in there. Normally, by the time you hear a tune, I've gone through this whole process, I've got rid of the bits I don't like, and I've polished, and it could just be things by moving notes around or just changing the pitch slightly or putting in a harmony that make it sound finished at that point but those are the details it's the details that take a lot of work now another thing that's important as well at least for me when I'm composing is that I like some of the details that are in the background so um, I think I've got a harp sound down here let me just find that and these are the pretty bits really as in they're not really instrumental um, forgive the pun to getting the whole melody in there but these are the bits that sound nice and are put in the background so I put I normally put these in buried in the mix just to add a bit of interest and a bit of um, high-end stuff so let's have a listen <laughs> now originally started out as a ocarina and I put a bit of slide on there but I want to get rid of that. It sounds better on the harp. Let's just have a listen to that. I've got 
cucumber in there as well, just to thicken it up. So normally at this point I'll, I'll take it down and then by the time we've got the other instruments in, I'm going to use a bit of trumpet just for now. Now one of the things I want to put in there, and this is quite important, I want to put a bit of synth in there just to add like a, a bell tree, but I want it to be quite synthetic there and I'm going to use that as a segue or transition into the, the next part, which would be my, uh, I suppose, chorus. So it's that bit there that I want. Now I'm going to show you uh, my, my first synth after uh, when I was working at said music shop from earlier on. My first synth was a Juno 106 and it was great because it has all the knobs and sliders on which are really important for a synth. Um, shortly after that they, they brought up the DX7 which was really powerful but it didn't have knobs and sliders on and it, it made it very hard to actually program and to use. But thanks to the power of modern technology I've got this Juno 106 which is very, very similar to the synth, the, the physical synth that I had. And for anybody who's starting out, go over to Cherry Audio or over to Tell Audio. They both do a Juno Type 106 for not very much money at all. This is 25 bucks, this one. And it sounds just like the Juno. It's a single oscillator, which means it's got one noise source, which is here. And it's also got a filter, which is like a glorified tone control with resonance, which means it's got a peak where you decide to take the, um, the, the tone control system down. And it's also got uh, a fairly basic envelope, but it, most of these have an ADSR, Tactic K Sustain and Release. So for anybody starting out who's into synthesis and sound design and just programming in general, this is a great start. So what I would it for, I've got the arpeggio on and So it sounds a bit cheesy, but if we start off really high, I need to put my resonance up. Here we go. So I'm going to put that in in a minute. I've actually wired this up to a control. I've got a, a thing called a machine jam, which is um, eight. Um, so it's eight virtual sliders. It's well, the, the physical. You just press them, and you can see on the software that it's, it's moving the frequency here and the resonance there. So I need to put the frequency up for the start of this and let's go and try and record this transition in. Let's have a listen. There we go. So all I need it to do is And then once I've got that, I'll turn it down just so it's very subtle and in the background. And it's it's just a C7 chord here. Let's have a go. And that's all I wanted it to do, just a bit of synth magic in the background. Let's have a listen. Now for me that, that curve isn't quite working, so I'm just going to see if I can pick up the, there it is, 54, control 54, and I'm going to use a different curve here. Um, parabolic curves normally give a bit more variation throughout the curve. Let's have a listen. No, that's the wrong way. Let's try it this way. Just finding that sweet spot. It's kind of two. We've got. Let's try it this way. Fortunately, using Cubase, we can um, draw that curve in. Lovely. That'll do. I'm just going to give it that one more time. Cool. And then we're going to go into the chorus. Now we need something a bit happier for the chorus because it's it's quite laid back for the verse. And so here I've chosen. It's, it's similar-ish because it needs to be related, but 
at the moment I've got this for my chorus. So let's see where we are with this and we'll, we'll see what we need to add or take away from it. So that's where I'm, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to tidy that up and make it into a proper piece so it's, it's quite nice to listen to. But the, the next section of this is it's going to be something a bit darker. Now at the moment we've, we've just concentrated on something being quite laid back to listen to but in video games that rarely lasts long. We set the scene and we, we start exploring and before we know it there's going to be something quite dark happening and somebody's going to be chasing you and you're going to have to be running and fighting. So the next section I would normally work on is a, a chase scene, some, something seeing you it's coming after. And it, it also has to be related as well to the, the scene that we've just done with the beach and everything, but it needs to be darker. And what I'd do is normally uh, make this a bit faster as well. So we need a lot more drums, it needs to be a bit darker. So for this one I'm using, it's a, a good plugin, um, works on the contact sampler, it's called Damage 2, it's got about 30 gigs of great sounds. Now some of these sounds as the ones I'm using here are loops, so they're, they're looped and you, you simply play them on the keyboard, let me have a go at that. I'll just find my arm track, two seconds, get rid of that, I'll go up to this one, here we go. So it's divided into three. I've got low loops here. Got the mid loops. And then I've got my high loops as well. So that would give me something that is quite quick and easy to get hold of. Now the next thing I, I would do there is I'd actually go through and replace those loops and play all of the drum parts manually. You can hear them cutting off and if you were to get um, your instrument and use just samples and play them you're going to have a bit more feeling and it's not going to cut off and it's going to sound a whole lot natural and it's a lot easier to mix as well which is important. Great stuff. So um, at this point, the, the final thing I'd, I'd do here, if I'd finish the piece off, is to actually mix a thing. And uh, again, we're going going back to that bowl and making sure that everything is is loud enough to listen to. But it's, it's got to be balanced quite well. We need the lead sound right in the middle, 
everybody needs to hear the, the main sound, the bass needs to be tightened at the bottom and everything else is there to support those two things. And then finally, what I would want to be doing is to master it. Now there's loads of mastering plugins out there, but for this one I'm just going to use something really simple. I'm going to use uh, the dynamics that come with Cubase. Now Cubase, uh, in fact it's, it's Nuendo, it just happens to be the one that I'm familiar with, but there are many great doors and you're going to need one of those. And if you're starting out, either Cubase Elements or something like Live Light would be absolutely brilliant. Because considering when I started, everything was really, really expensive. And to get anything with Live Light or Cubase Elements or, or any of the other ones, you'd have to spend a fortune um, when I started. But now you can just get something fairly inexpensive and get some great results very quickly. And all I'm going to do here is add a maximizer as well. When I can find my maximizer plugin, here we go. And um, just turn that down because that's always a bit hot. And then at that point, I should have something that is. So the next thing I would add to that is some distorted chords and then start giving them a, a bit of movement by using filters, uh, rhythmic filters, where I can vary the cut off um, and sync it up to the actual tempo of the machine. But I don't have time to do that today. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of a generic way I would go about composing a track for a, uh, a video game. So I think at this point I'm going to hand it back over to Daniel and we'll see if we have any questions that people would like answering. All righty then. Um, all right, all right, all right. So, um, well, then, if you are at this point, then let's just uh, start with the questions. So, if anyone has questions for Dave, please put it up in the chat. I will do my best to uh, ask him these questions. Uh, first of all, um, what I would like to uh, say, uh, as far as the questions are coming in, uh, we got viewers from New York, Connecticut, Canada, uh, Utica, Lisbon, Mexico, from the UK, from the East Coast, USA, uh, Netherlands, California, Brooklyn, Napoli, Norway, Belgium, Brazil, Ireland, Japan, which is absolutely insane. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, to everyone who is here today. It's really crazy um, how much countries are watching at the moment. And um, uh, shout out to your squeaky chair, Dave. Thank you. A lot of people uh, are... Uh, I'm going very to, interested I'm, in your chair. That's great. I'm going to sample that and, and make it available as a downloadable sound font for everybody that they can use in their own productions. Uh, you're saying that, but people really requested that in the chat, so <laughs> you're doing them a favor. <laughs> there we go. So I, th I think the other okay. thing, the, the, uh, the, the, the one thing I want to say is, I mean, this is obviously the first time that I've ever done anything live, so I've got no no idea how how these things go so it's it's a great learning curve but um hopefully absolutely ho hopefully if uh, people are interested i'll start doing more in-depth ones and, and address it because I, I get asked quite a lot about how did you get this stuff into um dkc2 mm -hmm. on on the snes now that really is quite geeky and in-depth but uh, i'll probably look at something like that in aquatic ambience at, at, at a later date i'm going to sample that and, and make it very Okay, great. Um, well, there is definitely a lot of interest in um, more educational videos from your side. Um, so let's start. First of all, thank you for this perfect um, first question for this perfect nickname that I have to read out. Um, what circumstances and mindset uh, slash emotions did you summon to compose Thickerbrush Symphony or Forest Interlude? Um, I think they were written at, at the time. Things used to come out in the. Um, it, it, there was a cycle that used to go on. So you you try and get everything ready to be out for Thanksgiving on the twenty first, and you'd need about three months before that time to finish the game as as best as you could. Although it was always tight, you were always pushing things in at the last moment. So a lot of the music 
for or the main brunt of the game of those pieces were written in winter when it was there wasn't a lot of daylight the daylight was short and it was often snowing or rainy and that's quite a good environment to write into because it, it's a bit it, it's almost magical and quite rhythmic so they they were the they really had quite a lot to do with it and also when I was writing them I was trying to stretch the capacity or the, or the, the sound chip because there's only 64k on there I was just trying to stretch it to its very limits and some things worked on it and some things didn't so when I found the things that did work with the memory then I'd, I'd really push those and that influenced a lot of the music Okay, great um, Second question from the same person um, I guess uh, it's pretty well known but Maybe you can answer it again in a short, uh, in a short sentence. Um, what's the story behind the Donkey Kong Country 3 uh, Game Boy Advance soundtrack in uh, comparison to the um, Super Nintendo version? Ah, there we go. Yeah, I, I get asked this quite a lot, so let, let's answer that one. The Super NES was working on, on a TV back in when it when it came out. It would it would have been played on a desktop uh, monitor or something like that, or a TV. And they have a lot of bass. They they have a full bandwidth. So if if we go back to let me just find my bowl again, which I, I really find in. If you can imagine, you got rid of the bass and you got rid of the details, and we were putting something on the Advance Game Boy, which had its own two speakers in, but it wasn't very. Um, it didn't have a lot of bandwidth. The frequency range was very limited. It's all mid range. So anything you did in the bass. And Evelyn used a lot of bass instruments to great effect to, to add mood to her pieces. So if I, I, I did try copying Evelyn's, but if I put them on there, the, the bass would drop right off. You'd never hear it. And that was a big, big shame because that was quite a lot of the track. And also the, the high end details that the SNES does quite well because it had this re, it had this four bit resampling thing. So all the, all the details in the high end, they they held out pretty well. But by the time they got into the advanced Game Boy, it just it's this thing called anti-alazing or something like that anyway it destroys all of the bell sounds and all of the harp sounds and so we have this really thin layer to to work with of sounds and it just wasn't going to work now i when i did this stuff on the snes i obviously wrote it for the tv because that's the thing everybody was going to listen to it but on on the advanced game boy you're going to listen to it on the advanced game boy so i actually wrote rewrote the music purposely for the advanced game boy speakers so it wasn't ever developed on anything else. It was just the advanced Game Boy. And and a lot of the, the, the DKC tracks, the way they were originally written, just wouldn't translate well unless you did a, a lot of work and a lot of differences. And we only had a limited... I think I had six weeks, I think it turned into eight, to write the whole soundtrack, which meant I just couldn't use the instruments that we'd want to. I had to put a whole new sound set in, make sure they worked, and at that point write the tunes at the same time which is a very integrated process so on, on that Game Boy we, we just had to go with the hardware and make it work on the hardware anything else would it, it, it would have sounded a lot worse so that's why we made the best of the the hardware that we had to work with and that's why I had to change the compositions they would they'd have taken far longer to adapt for the advanced Game Boy okay thank you very much for that Wakaru uh, asks, um, do you handle all your mixing and mastering on every project? Um, there was a, 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 well, there still is a very talented chap called Dave Clinique, and he helped out with the <laughs> stuff on uh, Tropical Freeze. He, he worked at, at Rare. He's, um, he doesn't work there anymore, but he's still available for mixing. So if you need some awesome mixers, get hold of Dave Clinique. Uh, but on the whole, I handle most of the mixing and the mastering at my end myself. So you see, guys, the master masters his own stuff. Yeah, and, and some of the reason for that is there's normally a very tight schedule. So I, I don't have the luxury of being able to give it two weeks before I start doing it. I normally have to send it off and then somebody's saying, yeah, great, that's in the game now. On to the, you know, and by that point, you've, you've written lots of other tracks. So it's it's more right. necessity rather than the, the, the way it's going. You, you, ideally, you'd want somebody else to take them, do a great job on them, but we don't have that luxury most of the time just for just because they need to be out there. And also, when you're writing video games, the music comes right at the end of the chain, so all the graphics are done first, the gameplay, and then eventually, 
it gets to the audio guys to start adding sound effects, putting speech on and, and stuff. So that normally comes later on in the project. And there's that timeline that you're working with is often a lot shorter than the luxury many of the artists would have as well. Okay. Um, Michelle or uh, Mikel Hernandez, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, who are some of your... Um, favorite or greatest video game composers uh, I, I i don't listen to video game composers um really i well i tend to listen to a film composers people like Hans zimmer and james newton howard but mainly the people i listen to for video game stuff would be the russian composers such as tchaikovsky and prokofiev and that's the stuff that really resonates with me that that's what makes me um I don't know, it just makes me tick. So when I hear something by them, I always try and incorporate those those ideas, that their emotional cues into the stuff that, that I'm writing. But as for um, video game game composers I, I admire, there, there, there are many, obviously, Grant Kirkhope, uh, Steve Burke, the, the guys that play Tonic, Dan and Matt, the uh, new Bo Yumatso, uh, completely brilliant. I've been to uh, quite a few of his shows and that they're always amazing. Um, the um, so get, names aren't really my forte, but um, the chap who wrote Plock, I thought he did, an, that was on the Super NES. I thought he did an amazing job with that. And um, uh, people like Richard Jakes as well, who, who's an English composer, he's done some fantastic work, especially with his Bond stuff. So the, the, there are there are too too many to mention, but uh, some seriously seriously talented people out there. Great. Um, Gen X official asked, or well, it's more like a demand. Please tell me more about Wizards and Warriors. I guess maybe you could tell us uh, a bit about your inspiration or how you came up with uh, the soundtrack of uh, this or those four games. Uh, because I read the chat, a lot of people really loved your composition on the four uh, Wizards and Warriors games. So, well, we three on NES, one on Game Boy. Yes, if uh, anyone is uh, uh, asking. absolutely. My, um, I mean, that was really early days now. When I was a teenager and still at school, I was exp I had my piano. I was, I was doing my piano lessons, as, and as I said earlier, I'd learnt to play by ear. But I'd also started composing tunes as well. So I'd, I'd hear something by somebody and think, well, you know, it, it would be nice if we took that chord progression and put this different melody on it. And so they they were really my early experiments from from the age of fourteen and fifteen, and certainly the main. Um, there's one. I'll, I'll try and play it. Let me just uh, pull a piano sound up. So we can do that because, you know, we're here. So let me just add a piano sound here. So sorry, I'm going to just um, move you over. <laughs> and uh, You guys are making him work again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not like work, though, is it? I mean, you know, it could be it's better than having a proper job. You just make stuff up and create all the time. It's very fulfilling. Anyway, I'm going to um, get contact up wherever it is, and I'm going to pull a piano sound up. And let's go for grand. So this is my favourite piano sound because it sounds like the um, well, it sounds like my piano in my living room. So two seconds. Let me go back and make sure I'm not armed on any other stuff. There we go. Let's get rid of that. And where's my piano? Two seconds. Bear with me. Talk among yourselves. That's uh, I need that one. So hopefully, there we go. Okay, so um, this one here. Obviously inspired hugely by Bach, and the reason it works on early Game Boy is that you've got. Um, you've only got three tones, so if you can put something as an arpeggio and put the melody on at the same time and have a counterpoint, which is what this does, so you get... Sorry. So yeah. It 
it lends itself very well to the NES hardware. And, but it was one of my early things that I wrote before, uh, whilst I was still at high school. So that's where that came from. Mm. And most of those pieces were just the experiments I was making at high school that I um, transferred over to the NES. And that's where they all came from. So I, th I think looking back, because it was my, I, I, w I was very, um, very creative at that point, because obviously you can find and, and, and start composing and, and realize that the work that, or the, the ideas that you've done, you can put into an NES and, and it kind of works on the hardware. So that was all good. So I was very excited about that. The fact that you could take something you'd, you'd written at school, put it on this hardware and people liked it or it seemed to fit. That was great. So that's where Wizards and Warriors came from. Awesome. We're getting a lot of questions. So sorry if I don't follow up with you guys via the chat. I'm trying to uh, get a hold of every question. So, um, Catalyst uh, is asking, is it allowed to arrange, perform some of your DKC music on live instruments? If not, is there a way to get permission? Well, all, all of the DK stuff... Um, does belong to Nintendo. They've, they've got like complete rights. It's their IP, so quite rightly they've got complete rights. So you would need to ask permission. Now it gets a, a grey area if you're not actually earning money from it, but really it would be ideal if you can ask permission to use something by Nintendo. But uh, as, as a if you're not really earning any money and you're doing it for your own benefit and enjoyment and you're not monetizing it then it it shouldn't be an issue but obviously if it's going on tv whether you're earning money or not somebody's at some point um then you really should be asking uh permission to use it if you can get it ideally so if you wanted to go and put your own record out um i think there are other ways around it you've got prs mcps and as long as you're um doing it properly then there shouldn't be an issue hopefully that's answered that it's a bit of a gray area so dave is not a lawyer so please uh, contact your uh yes regional nintendo office to ask for permission yeah or, or just your, your music <laughs> licensing thing because it's it's different for each country so what happens in the uk and what happens in america will be completely different to australia or japan or elsewhere so it's different for every region and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> there you go. Another question we already answered. So um, now we're going to get it a bit, bit more technical. Um, okay. Luca Di Gennaro asks, uh, do you work with an already mixed template and um, volumes were already good here? Uh, okay, that, that's great. Thank you, Luca. Um, Luca did a, an amazing uh, rendition of uh, a couple of my tracks. On, he's, he's got this... Um, Moog Sub 37 and he just multi-tracked it and you can find them online um, but do I use a template? Uh, it's a good way of working to, to actually have a template especially if you're doing orchestral stuff where you've got all of your instruments that you can just load in a contact thing and you've got your strings on, on one, your brass on the other, percussion on another but I find that if I use templates I start at exactly the same place so I tend not to use templates. I have a, a fresh palette each time and I'll bring in the ones that I want to use next. So the things that um, are important, like the, the melodies, which is where I normally start, or the drums, and um, I'll, I'll get those going and then start adding textures as I like. But to actually use a template, it, it's not something I do because I keep going back to the same thing time and time again. So just to add that bit of variation, that, that randomness, I'll, I'll start with a clean, clean slate every time. Perfect. And um, in addition to that, uh, Jesse Martin asks, uh, do you have a favorite key to write in? Um, I'm very familiar with C because I'm a keyboard player and I'm very familiar with C minor because it's E flat and that's what key my alto sax is in. So those two are very familiar keys. However, I spent years and years and years and years playing in bands. So I'm quite happy to play in E. A, G, D, those very familiar um, chords for, for rock bands. And um, th th they're all the same, really. They're just, you know, your fingers might might need a bit of coaxing if you haven't played that key. But th for me, they all do the same thing. So uh, it's probably irrelevant which key they are in. Some do sound different, though. D minor is quite a sad one. C sharp minor is even more... Um, wistful really or, or even more more depressing depending or, or and hopeful as well 
So they all seem to have their own <laughs> kind of character, which is a bit bizarre, really, because mathematically it's just, you know, it's just a division on the scale. So it's it's kind of odd how different frequencies affect us as human beings and that kind of psychology that's really interesting and a conversation for another time i think i think you'd feel there we go i think you'd feel hours talking about <laughs> that wouldn't you? absolutely probably but that's not a bad thing you know oh no absolutely and it's really interesting and uh, maybe uh, some of you don't know that but uh, they've got a fantastic uh band i don't want to call it cover band but you know they cover songs as well, and uh, their drama was also absolutely fantastic. Nigel is in the chat right now. Oh, brilliant. Hi, Nigel. So um, <laughs> give, him, give him some love. <laughs> um, speaking of live, yes. Clerk9 asks, would you ever perform, uh, perform Donkey Kong Country music in a live band at an event such, uh, such as EGX or Video Games Music Live? We did... Um, we, we covered some of them over at MAGFest. Uh, MAGFest is in, uh, the, the one I've been to is over in Washington, D.C. I think, I think it's D.C. Um, my geography isn't as good as it should be, but I'm fairly sure that it's there. It's just in Maryland. And they have this thing called Music and Games Festival, which is just awesome. And about 20,000 people descend there straight after New Year's Day every year, unless it has been the last two years because obviously we've had this pandemic to deal with but m most years people descend there and it's just loads of musicians loads of games people loads of people in cosplay it's this fantastic uh show so if you haven't been next time it's on get over there it is awesome and that was where we we, we performed it so we do it occasionally uh, at the moment i'm working with kevin bayliss and, and nigel and phil which um our band called the dave wise five because it's just got a nice ring to it and uh, we're working on <laughs> new material in fact we worked on new material we're, we're getting close to releasing it soon and um, that is all our own material now we own the IP on that so we can as in the intellectual property so we can perform that and do as much as stuff as we want with it but um, I'm sure we will play a few Donkey Kong ones every now and again because um, people like to hear it which is good I'm not complaining at all it's good Absolutely. And um, as David already t uh, said, uh, the pandemic um, put a break on a few things uh, that uh, he and I were talking about, uh, especially also in Germany, not ex uh, just in Germany, but um, just keep an eye on his Twitter. And um, maybe in the future, as soon as uh, the whole pandemic is over, you know, in the next 10 to 75 years when the pandemic yes, comes, it's, it's finally uh, over. maybe we can... Yeah, <laughs> maybe we can uh, talk about uh, something in different countries. Yeah, so we, we did have actually um, last year, and they were going to be moved to this year, but it's still still fairly rampant. Um, we, we did have lots of shows in lots of different countries lined up. So uh, hopefully they'll get postponed to 22 and 23, and we'll take it and resume the live shows at that point, because they're always great fun, and it's always lovely to come and meet uh, fans around the world always good absolutely um adh gaming asks what what was your favorite game you composed for my favorite game the one that i enjoyed um, i mean i d let's be honest you're writing music for video games M video games are ace anyway you know and then you're writing music for them and when you write them and you've finished it and you've put it with the action to see whether it works uh it, it's always such a huge um, source of uh, 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 what's the right word uh, anyway satisfaction let's go with that one it's it's amazing so it's uh, as far as the job goes you know it's it's up there it's a really good job very creative love it to bits so um uh, sorry daniel I've, I've gone off on one the uh, specifically one. Oh, it's all right <laughs> <laughs> i've had lived <laughs> i digress it's all good it's all good i'm, pre I'm pretty sure they're happy um Ba, 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 ba. Nigel says, uh, I, I should tell you this probably an inside joke, uh, that you got a viewer from Svetlin Code, and you'll love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Nigel, I hope I made you happy. Um, all right, uh, Gianni Abel asks, do you find that having an academic background in music is a necessity these days if you want to pursue a career in video game music or to be a video game music composer? 
um, it's quite complex. I mean, we, we use tools such as Wise and FMOD, and I, I learnt most of my stuff on the job, but I've had quite a few years to learn it on the job, really. So certainly in the early years, I had to catch it with the technical stuff, you know, the typing in codes and assembling stuff. It, fortunately, it's not that hard anymore. But you, you still need to be competent and using tools such as WISE uh, from Audio Kinetic and FMOD and tools such as that and um, knowing your door, your, your digital audio workstation inside out are really quite important, especially when you, you've got to get sound effects in there and you need to get them in there fast or you need music because it isn't just a case of writing one piece of music on the whole. Um, as, as I was trying to demonstrate earlier, once you've got your initial piece of music, the chances are your video game hopefully is going to be very dynamic and things are going to change so you're going to need to ch start changing your instruments you're going to start to need to change your tempo and you need some very smooth transitions so it isn't one piece of music in in a good video game that one piece of music is probably going to be 20 different music and transitions so it's it's a lot of work therefore having as much information and technical information about music is quite important whether you need all the um because uh, I can read music, I don't read music, I'll, I'll always do it by ear because it's a lot faster. So I don't think in those technical terms, but having the tools that once you've got your initial idea that you can run with it and make something of it is very important. So they're the tools that you really need to, to work out how to use. Things like VST instruments, how to use the, um, the, the inflections and the key changing, that sort of thing. And then once you've got your piece and you've got to learn how to mix and that takes, you know, the, people who mix spend years learning how to mix and, and as as a composer you, you really need to know that as well and being able to mix and master and deliver all of these things there's a lot of disciplines involved in being a video game composer and um, have any help that you can get especially at the beginning things that people can bring uh, and, and suggest ideas and having somebody who's going to push you in the, in the right way I think is really important so if you can, if you can get on a decent college course it really is going to help your hand when you start going into the marketplace. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we got a lot of questions. Um, guys, uh, normally we would have um, been finished at, um, yeah, at 7.30, well, uh, German time, but um, Dave, would you um, go on for another 15 minutes to answer the questions of yeah, the people? Uh, I'm, I'm happy, Let, let's keep, keep them going. Okay, then. Then uh, let's see what we have here. Um, John O'Donnell asks, um, if you hand over your music to the rest of the dev team, um, what does the finished product look like? Is it, is, is it a WAV file or a similar or a MIDI track? What kind of files do you hand over? Uh, it depends on the project. On the whole, it will be a WAV file or an AI, AIF file, but let, let's go with WAV files. Um, but that might not be small enough. Pardon me. A lot of time, um, people want compressed files, so it might be MP3. The, the better compression one is FLAC, which still holds up quite well. That's a lossless one. And so when it decomp uh, decodes it, it goes back into its original WAV for format. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, yeah, there, there are many different file systems and that you might want to de deliver with, sorry. And also... There are times when we still use MIDI, and the reason we still use MIDI is that we can put a sound set in there, and we can we might have a track going where we've got all, as many instruments on the WAV file, but we need to spot in different um, instruments depending on the background. So if we've got a certain body or we've got certain background features, they might need a musical sound attaching to them, and the easiest way to do that is to have a MIDI file as well. So mainly WAV and MIDI files. Okay, then um, a question from Azar61 and Wirebird, basically are almost the same. Basically, they ask, uh, what, is your, what is your favorite, uh, favorite um, instrument, and do you have a tier list, like from, let's say, from one to three, what are your favorite instruments to use? Favorite instruments, if I'm playing live, um, I love saxophone. I wish I had more time to practice it, and I wish I played it better, but I really enjoy playing it. And so that's probably my number He's one. He's too modest, guys. <laughs> so that's that's my <laughs> number one instrument. The other instrument, because it's really useful. Okay. 
is how do you the piano. how do you have oh okay Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so and and, the, and uh, as for a third in, piano, a third instrument. What could the th a guitar? I, I play guitar quite a bit uh, too. So I've got guitars all the way around the the room. I'm not so competent on guitar, so I'll play a bit and then I'll start chopping it up and quantizing the audio, which is very naughty. It's much quicker to get somebody who can actually play, but. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes because you have to chop it up and you have to sort of think outside the box and it's not a normal guitar you come up with some different ideas so it's not all bad um, but I do like playing the guitar as well and it's uh, I've got many so a um, bit of a collection thing going on there that's awesome um, Anton Smulders asks uh, how do you deal with writer's block if you ever had any of course it's not so much writer's block it's the um, Fortunately, if, if I see something or somebody shows me, I will get an idea instantly, which is great. Uh, but it's not the writer's block that's the problem. The The big problem for me is if you've got an idea, you've got to make it work in the video game as there'll be a sp specific set of circumstances that, that that music has to work within. So if there are very strict features of the gameplay that your music has to work with then that's where it gets to be a challenge I, I love a challenge i love technical challenges i like to get things working i like things to sound as good as possible but if something isn't working it means you're going to have to put a lot more gray matter and thinking outside the box and just chipping away at something to get it to work and that's really where most of the time goes in writing video game music. The, the ideas come quickly. It's the implementation and the delivery and making sure that it works fluidly within a video game so people find that it, well, it sounds simple. And at that point, you know you've done quite well. But to get to that point, that can be a lot of work. So it's not really writer's block. It's making something work within the confines of the gameplay and the music that you've got to work with. Sometimes it does get quite technical. In fact, it always gets quite technical to be honest. So, uh, so that 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 would be okay. the biggest challenge. Understood. Um, has any composer that influenced your work, like uh, Vangelis or Phil Collins, acknowledged your work in the Donkey Kong Country games? So, did you ever get a check or a, a, a pat on the back from Phil Collins? Uh, no. Well, we, we, I was talking. Um, with a, a band, um, the, the Proto Men, and they, they'd used a similar patch in one of their pieces, which is actually on Cobra Kai. I think I'm allowed to mention that. Um, and they'd used the, it was a, it's a Roland CR78. And when I was working at that music shop that we, we saw earlier, I, I used to sell those, and they were, they were huge expensive. They were about a £1,000 30 years ago. So you're looking at, I don't know, probably six or £7,000 now. Um, by comparison, but even even if you want to buy one of those, they're, they're probably going to set you back even now three or four thousand pounds, which is about five or six thousand dollars. So they are a lot of money. And for me, they they sound kind of cool, but they're, they're not really that good because it's it, they're really simple waveforms that they're using. And I I wanted the same thing on the Super, N uh, Super NES, and I didn't you know you couldn't put the drum machine in there and you couldn't sample it because you'd never had enough sample memory. So what I did, I, I recorded um, the sounds that they used from the CR70 from my ACR78 and got them down to single cycle waveforms and resynthesized it, and that's how I got the sounds for the Phil Collins track um, or the similar sounding thing. And all he used, he, he got the original unit and just used the preset button, which is great. But I mean, things like In the Air Tonight and some of the other stuff that used uh, absolutely phenomenal tracks. So I was just trying to get that vibe into DKC2 and get the same sounds, which I use quite a lot. So it was, um, yeah, enjoyable stuff. But uh, Phil has never <laughs> phoned me up and said, "Hey, great job there, Dave." Not yet, anyway. But um, uh, but uh, I've always been a big f fan of Phil Collins, anyway. So awesome stuff. Wasn't there? I uh, I forgot his name. Sorry, everyone. Um, the rapper who uh, sampled some of your stuff. Uh, there's been quite a few. So we've had. Um, um, uh, there's Drake and um, Donald. Uh, anyway. Donald Glover, yeah. Right. Yeah, Donald Glover, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, amazing yeah. artists in, in their own right, and it's really cool when they've taken something that you've done and made it completely different. And um, 
yeah, and it's, it's Boy Wonder who did the stuff for Drake, and just just mm-hmm. amazing to to hear it. And you know, their stuff is awesome anyway, hugely influential, and so it was just great. It was a real pat on the back and, and a real honour that they'd actually want to take something that you've done and <laughs> use it in their material. So it was really cool. So uh, thank you. And uh, but yeah, loads of people have done it, and uh, it always. Uh, I don't know, it's always nice to listen to. It always makes me smile. So, yeah, thank you. It's nice. And if you guys uh, didn't listen to Proto Man, please do it. I'm a huge fan. They're fantastic, if you like. Very, very great um, rock opera sounding like mixture of Meatloaf and, and Deep Purple and Pink Floyd and, and Queen. It's just right at, uh, up your alley. It's a fantastic band. I love them. Yeah, they're, they're if you guys awesome, are watching. I love you. Yeah, they're, they're, they're an awesome band, and also they were at Magfest um, <laughs> when we were there last year, and and they were the last band on the main stage. And as it stands, they'll still be the last band to have played at Magfest. So let's hope the uh, things improve around the world, and we get out and can go and see great bands like Protoman live once again. I hope so. Yeah. Great. Uh, Major Scale asks, uh, I am wondering if Dave was supposed to be the composer for Donkey Kong Racing for the Nintendo GameCube. And if you were, um, are there any unused tracks? Um, oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, and if, if, if you were, um, uh, did you use the tracks for other games? Sorry. So uh, I wasn't. We, we had a very talented um, chap called Ben Cullum who was working for us at the time. And his, his brother has done quite well in the jazz world. And he, he writes amazing songs still, and he, he'd done the tracks for that particular game. Uh, awesome sounding stuff, so I, I wasn't involved in that one. I, w- I would have been working on something else at that time, which is why I wasn't involved. But um, no, I certainly wouldn't have used those tracks for anything else. Okay. Uh, how did you work around having to compress everything to fit on the tiny Super Nintendo cartridges? So what I'm... And uh, by um, nine as well, sorry. Yeah, okay, so um, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a separate stream for that one, probably a recorded one, because it's quite technical. Can't explain it in five minutes or two minutes or even 30 seconds. And I'll show how I did it to get everything onto the Super NES and create tracks like Aquatic Ambience and Sticker Bush Symphony because I think that needs a dedicated um, slot or a dedicated stream. So that's that's a question for another time, but I will get there. We will do that. And at the same time, I would put in the other question from Fog Lake Production who asked basically um, how it was to compose for the Game Boy. So maybe you could put that in there in the next session slash lesson as well yeah so the 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 game boy again i'll i'll probably start off with just a a little mini stream explaining what we did for the nes and the game boy because they're they're very very similar sound chips uh, eight nine ten chips or two pulse Mm -hmm. uh, triangle and a noise channel and there are lots of great vst so you you can actually create something that will sound just like those um so we'll, we'll go into all of that and i'll include in that live stream all of the people who do some great emulations or uh, even use the same samples or the same techniques to 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 create those kind of tracks but i think that's that's again it's definitely something that needs to be sorted on on its own um Mm -hmm. uh, on on its own stream or tutorial type thing absolutely um remedy uh, remedy sorry is asking uh for games like tropical tropical freeze how do you collaborate with other composers creating music for the same soundtrack okay so we had obviously yamamoto uh, kenji yamamoto yeah okay, yamamoto san um he, he was he, he was like my boss on that one which is great i mean if you're gonna have a boss why not have yamamoto san and uh, absolute gentleman uh great fun to work with on the whole, I'd been left to do probably the majority of the track, but when I needed Yamamoto-san's help, then he would um, go off on one and really deliver. And he, also, he has a sound team that deals with all the external um, games that Nintendo they bring in. So he used some of the composers that he normally works with to do some of the extra boss tunes and things like that. Um, so that was great. I didn't really have to deal with it, but what... what uh, Yamamoto-san's main uh, involvement was what we did 
it's, it's, it's on the African plains and we used a lot of African samples to, to make that level work and he got the choir, sorted the choir out for that and recorded it and just did an absolutely phenomenal job. So if, if you haven't, you know, if by chance you haven't played Tropical Freeze, pick it up and play it because the um, when you hear the the, the choir samples in there um, that, that, that is Yamamoto San who's organized it all and he's got all the singers involved and they do an absolutely amazing job so check it out great um, one more thing a lot of people ask uh, during your composition today um, if your song will be available Yes, it will probably be available straight after the weekend. I need to sort it out. I know what I'm going to do with it. And uh, I think I'm going to do it in two ways. I'll, I'll sort it out as a, a song that you can probably get from uh, SoundCloud or download from there. And we'll do it under the um, Salamander symbol. But I'll put the details online. And I think because it's it's for really for a tutorial, I'm going to put the individual stems in there as well. So if anybody wants to download the whole load of the stems then they can put that in their project and play around with it and see what I've done with it. And I might even, I'll probably provide the MIDI as well. That would be quite useful. And they're the sort of there things, uh, they're the things that when, when I was learning, I'd have loved to have seen that, especially to have things in individual stems. Because on, on the whole, you listen to everything as a whole and you have to go through and work out or make a best guess about what the composer was doing but to have as a resource all of those individual stems I mean for me that would have been priceless and um, <laughs> when I did manage to get scores I got some John Williams scores and um, saw what you've done with the Raiders of the Lost Ark and he's, you've got all the individual stems and as an educational exercise it really makes a lot of sense to see how people how other composers group instruments together the sounds they're using and then when you listen to the track it really starts to to sink in and you learn so much as a composer and musician about why people use the sounds they used where they did and, and that's the important thing and that's what i was trying to get across today it's putting things in context you start off with getting your c sound so you, you're in the right space and then you'd want to start hearing some um, ocarinas and steel drums and, and start putting guitars with that and how they all interact with each other they're the important things that when you listen to it as a whole it's really hard to understand but when they're broken down into individual sections you go oh yeah of course that, that's easy um, so earlier um, someone made the suggestion you should call the song uh, squeaky squares squeaky so, squares uh, yeah maybe you could I'll, I'll get some. <laughs> Maybe you could use that. Absolutely. Now, the, the thing is, I, I brought my drum stool in. I'm on a drum stool at the moment. On the whole, I stand when I work. Oh, there we go. Um, so I stand up just because it's easier and it's a lot quicker to get stuff down for some reason when you're standing up. I find that when you're sitting down, you have to get up and then sit back down again, which wastes a lot of time. And thing, you want things as spontaneous as quick as possible. So on the whole, this is all set up for me standing up. So normally you wouldn't hear a squeaky chair, but I swapped this one for the chairs I have in the kitchen, which are even squeakier. So perhaps next time I'll do it standing up, but if I stand up, I tend to move around a lot more <laughs> and I'd be off camera all the time and yeah, from one side to the other. So that might not work either. So I thought the best thing would be to get my drum stool, even though it's squeaky, I will get those samples available. I'll put them in, in the pack with the, um, the tune as well. So you can squeak away to your heart's content. Great. Uh, yeah, some people were even interested in your hands. Um, maybe you could put in a hand camera the next time because they were really interested how fast your hands move during your uh, process and uh, what, what your hands are actually doing. Uh, I see. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll squeak for that one. Now, um, I mean, I'm not yeah. the best player in the world by, by a long shot. If, if you watch professional people who, who are you know, piano players, they're, they're just phenomenal. Whereas I'm winging it and fudging it all the time, which is composing music. I think that's the definition. You're not quite sure what you're doing. So you make a great guess about how you think it should be, and you'll you'll do play it over and over again, which is, is very useful. But then there's a bit of editing for all the things that I can't play that well. So I just have to make the best effort. And um, so they, they kind of work, but I think that's a good idea. I think having a, another webcam behind me looking down at my hands, I think we'll get that for next time. 
You know, the thing is, it's really, I, I don't know if this is a British modesty, but uh, your answer was pretty much the same uh, that Paul McCartney once gave when it cam, uh, came to his uh, composing style. Is that right? When he said, oh, he said the same thing, like, I, I, I just wing it most of the time. I can't, uh, I can't really play uh, instruments that well, but I can play a bit on different instruments. So... Um, there you go, and I mean a lot of people like him and a lot of people like you. So there you go. Yeah, I think I think Paul's probably got the edge, if if I'm on it. <laughs> slightly. Well, just just when it comes to uh, sold records, but yes, absolutely. You, know, you yes. don't have to. You don't have to be that <laughs> modest. <laughs> um, another technical question by uh, Kobe Burton: um, What are your uh, VST in must-haves for new composers? VST must-haves now. I think that that changes all the time. And recently, Spitfire Audio, if you go over to their website, they've released this orchestral thing, which has been done by the BBC. And they do various different, you know, you can have like the sort of beginner bit, the, the medium and, and the, the total top end. But even their baby orchestral suite for learning with is absolutely phenomenal. So I would go and get that. Uh, fortunately, things like... Um, uh, live light and cubase elements come with lots of sounds already so certainly more than enough to get you going with and then at that point it's working out the sounds that you like and saving up to actually buy them but you can't go wrong with the spitfire stuff that is um, especially for the orchestral things and whether you're doing synth stuff or band stuff having some orchestral samples is really going to help your production and getting over to Spitfire Audio and picking that up and learning how that all works is, you know, it's priceless. I, I, I would have loved that when I was younger. Okay, great. Um, Maximum Raver asked a question, which he refers to a bit strange, but uh, since I know the band, uh, I'm quite interested in if you know it as well. Uh, the band is called Camel. Camel, I've heard of them, but associating tracks with them, I'm afraid I... I wouldn't be able to do. If you do it, listen to the album Mirage. It's great. Mirage, okay. Personal tip of mine. Thanks, Dad. Um, and I'm very sorry, guys, but this will be the last question for today. Um, I'm terribly sorry. We have so many left and so little time. So we'll answer so, the... Um, uh, if you can save those, Daniel, we'll, we'll put those into the next live streams and uh, take yes. it from there. So th this last one, okay. let's go for it. Yes. And I think it's a good one. It's from uh, the Ypsilon. What were your expectations when you transitioned from the NES to the SNES? Were you impressed by the sound chip and did you miss any Yamaha FM chips or similar? So FM. Now, uh, I showed you the simulation it was a 106 which was my first synth but it does sound quite uh it's great synth but it's it's very one dimensional and then when the dx7 came out it was it sounded quite different there was a lot more detail in the sound those two synths work together if you've got a dx synth and you've got a, a juno synth that they work really well together so having learned how to use the juno i i, I sold that which you know looking back you might consider it a mistake that they're worth a fortune these days but the, the worst thing about it was it was really heavy any synth that's heavy just has to go because i'd much rather have a laptop and put them there so the the dx7 was the the one that i i learned most after that and it was on a little um i, I don't know led type thing very compact display lots of fiddling lots of menus but it was the dx method of com com uh, creating sounds that I was really familiar with so it did take quite a long time after learning how to do the DX stuff to then relearn how to do the analog where you're using filters and chipping away at sound rather than additive synthesis where you're you're doing stuff so I didn't really miss the the, the FM stuff so much I think at that point as well they've gone as far as they can but the the promise was on the Super NES that you had samples and if you could get a sample of a sound, it was going to sound far more impressive than either subtractive or additive synthesis. It was going to sound, hopefully, uh, like the instruments that, that you wanted to play. So I had all these big ideas because it's got eight, eight channels of sampling. And um, I thought that, that's, that's great. 
and then you read the specs and you realize that you only had 64k of memory which is phenomenally small uh, it's about 400 milliseconds of sound and you've got to try and get everything into that so if you were to play a, a cd you'd hear exactly 400 milliseconds if you use the 64k and then it would stop so the compression that was required to, to get all the instruments was was quite a technical challenge so it promised so much the Super NES but um, sadly with having so little memory it was quite a challenge to make it sound decent at all um, so yeah it was expectations and what you actually got were, were two different things um, but you know it it made you do it, you know that's why DKC2 soundtrack exist because I was getting around the limitations and that's always a fun thing to try and do I like a challenge okay then um, well I guess everything has come to an end sadly even uh, this fantastic uh, masterclass first of all David thank you so so much for your time uh, for um, your generosity to show uh, us, the fans, how you work and for answering all these questions. Um, then, once again, uh, thank you so much to the City Library of uh, Düsseldorf, who made all this possible. Show them some love on Twitter, show them, uh, show them some love on um, Facebook, or, and uh, even if you're from Düsseldorf or from Germany and COVID is over, show them some love and uh, go there in person. Um, I uh, just put in, uh, in the chat... Uh, our Facebook and Twitter channels as well. Once again, who am I? My name is Daniel. I'm just a regular uh, video game enthusiast, and I uh, know already New Day for a few years, and uh, we came up with this masterclass today. So um, please show a little love to us as well. And um, once again, thank you so so much for being there today. And yeah, maybe not sure if I. Oh, sorry. No, I was, was going to say, and thank you to, to everybody who's taken their time to, to chime in and watch this. I really appreciate it. You know, there's um, so many things vying for a time, so I really appreciate anybody who's actually chimed in to watch this. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. So, uh, And thank you, Daniel, and thank you to Dusseldorf City Libraries as well. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Absolutely. It has been, and... Um not sure if I will be there the next time or the next times, but definitely Mr. Wise will be there in the future, even with his project uh, Salamanders, which he is working with uh, Kevin Bayliss, who you maybe know even as uh, the father of Diddy Kong and for a lot of uh, different characters uh, at Rare as well. So check out uh, his channel or their channel as well, DK Creations. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, DKCreations.com, which stands for Dave and Kev Creations. So um, we'll be putting a lot of stuff on there coming up very shortly. Absolutely. So um, keep, keep an eye out for Dave's new material and uh, see you someday. Yes, Take some, someday. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been great. Cheers. Take care.